uh, I reached into my drawer on my desk and and I pulled out my 44 Magnum revolver and just that fast, I put it to my head and I squeezed the trigger and it clicked. And this is the gun that is my favorite gun. It was a 44, it was not gonna be half ass. I was gonna be gone. Hammer came down and no primers were touched, but it clicked on a revolver. Stay tuned, coming up, it's part two of my two-part interview with Scott Geiselhart discussing his challenges with post-traumatic stress and how it led him from a meth addiction and a suicide attempt to a career as a mental health counselor. But first, let's hear from our amazing sponsor, Midwest Fire. At Midwest Fire, they know better efficiency results in less waste, and it adds value to every truck they deliver. That's why they have worked hard to implement lean manufacturing processes throughout their factory. Lean manufacturing means a lower cost to build with the savings passed on to you. To learn more, visit MidwestFire.com. Hello and welcome to Situational Awareness Matters Show, episode 334. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by our new online training platform, Gassaway Virtual Training. Rich Gassaway served as a first responder for 33 years. Now he's an online university professor, researcher, podcaster, blogger, author, and professional speaker. Rich is widely considered to be a trusted authority to help work teams improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making outcomes. He has delivered over 2,500 live presentations worldwide and has helped more than 90,000 workers improve safety. Rich has authored six safety books, and his teachings have been featured and referenced in numerous books, research projects, journal articles, and podcast episodes. He has been presenting dynamic in-person training programs since 1992, and he has hosted virtual training courses since 2014. Some of Rich's most popular programs for first responders include how smart first responders use situational awareness to improve safety, firefighter safety, mistakes and best practices, and the leader's toolbox, best practices for officer success. His virtual learning platform makes it convenient to train your entire team at work, at home, or wherever they may be. We now have 33 online training programs for your members. Some of these programs are live events presented virtually, and some of them are pre-recorded programs. To learn more, visit samatters.com website and click on the virtual training tab. Okay, let's jump into today's feature segment, part two of my two-part interview with Scott Geiselhart discussing his challenges with post-traumatic stress and how it led him from a meth addiction and a suicide attempt to a career as a mental health counselor. Sense. Um, but after two years of no sleep and putting a lot of meth in my body, I went over to see my ex-girlfriend at her apartment. My two sons were there and, and something just snapped. I just, I, I did the same thing I did every time I was around them. I got angry and I yelled at them. I took things out on them that had nothing to do with them. And I remember leaving, leaving the apartment building and getting down to the shop and I'm like, I've got to stop myself because I'm going to hurt them someday. Something, I'm going to snap, I'm going to hurt somebody. I'm, you know, and I just don't like the person I am and enough is enough. I mean, I've been hurting for so long that I got to put an end to this. So I, uh, I reached into my drawer on my desk and, and I pulled out my 44 Magnum revolver and just that fast, I put it to my head and I squeezed the trigger and it clicked. 
And this is the gun that is my favorite gun. It was a 44. It was not going to be half ass. I was going to be gone. Hammer came down and no primers were touched, but it clicked on a revolver. So if you know anything about guns, that you know that's still to this day. You know, it used to kind of haunt me, wondering how that could possibly happen. But now it's like I'm, I've accepted that the, the bullet's not coming down the barrel anymore. I'm a survivor. I made it. You know. I'm very fortunate, you know, I, I believe in God, I believe in miracles. Um, right after that happened, I slammed the gun down on the desk and climbed the big desk behind me. I had like a horseshoe desk, great big nice cherry wood or horseshoe desk. And I climbed the desk behind me, I was up against the wall and I was just terrified. I thought that gun was going to spin around and shoot me or it was going to go off and blow my eardrums out. And I, I was sitting there not understanding how I could still be alive or if this was, you know, what happens after you're dead. I, I mean, nothing made sense. And I got down and I grabbed the gun and I unloaded the rounds out and I set it back down on the desk. And um, the, it was kind of weird because when I set it down, the cylinder actually wanted to close when it was empty, all the shells were out, but I couldn't let that cylinder close. For some reason I had to put a pin in the cylinder so the cylinder wouldn't close on the gun. That's how terrified I was that thing was still gonna go off. Um, because it was supposed to, you know, that's why I chose it. It was going to do the job. Um, and then after that, I was sitting at the desk and I just didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't understand how I was still alive. And I, I had the computer in front of me and the keyboard and I started typing on a Google search. And I typed in nightmares, flashbacks, anger, drugs, and I hit enter on a Google search and PTSD lit the screen up. And I uh, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I, that's not possible. I've never been in the military. Was, I, I always thought it was a military thing. Um, then I opened up the Mayo site and right on the top there, it said military and first responders. And I'm like, I didn't even know what PTSD was. I didn't know what the word letter stood for. So I started reading it and educating myself a little bit. And I, I'm like, my God, all the symptoms, that's me. That's this is it. Why didn't somebody tell me about this? I mean, somebody must have seen it. And then to find out how many, how many first responders are taking their lives. And I'm like, you know, just, and how isn't this talked about? I found out there was therapy for it, that I didn't have to live like this my whole life. I could get some help um, and get my life back. But just to find out it wasn't a split personality. This wasn't something permanent, something that was, was wrong with my brain. It was PTSD and it's, it's like I got a name to it now. Now, now it's something I can work on. And um, I studied it all that night and in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, um, I watched the clock and I went over to my ex-girlfriend's house and I knocked on the door and she opened the door a little bit and I, I, I shoved my way in. And I'm like, I got PTSD. I was screaming and my hands were in the air. I was like, I got PTSD. I found it. I found it. I'm not crazy. I got PTSD. And she was terrified of me. She thought I'd lost it. She had my sons behind her, protecting them from me. And the look on my kids' face, that they were actually scared of me, that I was there to hurt them. I've never physically laid a hand on my kids. I've yelled at them, though. I mean, I've, the verbal abuse was horrible. But they were scared of me. They were terrified of me. And I left there thinking they were never going to trust me again. I blew it. You know, I, I should have been dead. That gun should have went off. This, this shouldn't be something that is messed up. I'm not supposed to be alive. And I went back down to the shop. And on that desk, it's the horseshoe shape. I got to walk around the end where the gun was still in. And I remember looking at it thinking, I should just load that thing up and just Get, just start snapping until it does go off. I mean, it, it, how can it malfunction? The revolver doesn't malfunction like that. But instead, I sat down on my desk and I started making some phone calls. I gathered phone numbers over quite a while, probably at least five years um, of hotlines and, and people to call if I needed help because I knew there was something wrong with me, but I just couldn't. You know, I'm a rough, tough firefighter. Hey, we don't reach out for help. We're macho, you know, and this stuff's not supposed to bother us. So I'm not going to, it's not bothering me. I put it in the back of my head and I won't, I, I won't accept that. It's not, it's not bothering me. 
Well, I started making some phone calls and, and um, I called a suicide hotline, which was first on my list. And I called it 12 times and nobody answered. And um, I, 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 you know, again, I'm sitting there thinking, what, you know, how am I supposed to get help? Um, the next three phone numbers were phone numbers that my, one of my chiefs gave me and I got them probably about three, at least three years prior to this. And they were four first responders. There was some helplines and I called those three and all three of those were out of service, no longer existed. So I'm sitting there, it's like, okay, this isn't, this isn't easy. I'm, you know, I'm sitting there thinking nobody gives a damn about me. You know, I'm supposed to be dead. And I called, uh, I called the next one and it was a friend of mine that was a police officer. And I told him what I did. I said, I tried to kill myself. I said, I, said, I think I got PTSD. I said, I need some help. I need a friend. I need somebody to talk to. And, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about him. It's just the training, lack of training. He said, Scott, we're going to come pick you up and we're going to take you to the hospital. We're going to lock you up. And I was like, no, you can't lock me up. Aren't you listening? I just need somebody. I need a friend. I need somebody to talk to. I need somebody to help me understand what I'm going through, not be locked up and caged up like an animal. And I told him, I said, I got two more phone numbers on my list. I said, if they don't work, you can come out and get me. And I hugged the phone up. And like I said earlier, I got cameras all the way around that shop. And I had monitors in my desk. And I mean, there wasn't no place outside that you couldn't get to without me seeing them. So I was so scared that they were going to come and get me before they gave me a chance to, to reach out for some other help um, and cage me up like an animal that I went out and put my propane tanks and my settling tanks in my shop. And I grabbed my SKS and I loaded that up and laid that on my desk and I sat and watched the monitors for quite a while. Um, if they were going to come to get me, I was going to blow myself up, you know, not to hurt them, but they weren't going to, the shame, I think was more of the shame of me being locked up, you know, like a crazy person when I just found out I got PTSD and I've got a chance here. I want, I want to learn more about this. I want to know more about this. I, I don't want to be caged like an animal or drugged, you know, put on all these drugs, you hear horror stories. Well, after a while, nobody showed up and, um, I uh, started making the next phone number call, which uh, which was uh, somewhat local. It was fairly close. And it was a number that was on our whiteboard on the fire hall. And they said, if you have any issues where you want to talk to somebody, you can call this person. And the name was there. And I called and I talked to the person. I said, hey, I just tried to kill myself. I need to talk to somebody now. And she said, the soonest they can get me in was a week and a half. So I made the appointment for a week and a half out hung the phone up and I knew I was going to be dead by sunset. Nobody cared. Nobody wanted to listen. And then I got to the last phone number, which was uh, shared load program, national volunteer fire council. And I called that. And the whole time I was looking at my gun thinking, I mean, I was, I was surprised I wasn't loading it while I was calling that number, but I called it thinking, you know, nobody's going to answer this. And that's it. I've got no other choice but to, to finish the job. And it rang like twice and um, they answered. And I was desperate. I said, I need some help. Please help me. I said, I just tried to kill myself. I've got PTSD. I just need to talk to somebody. And the guy on the other end of the line, after talking to him, tell him what, who I was and stuff, where I was from, he said, Scott, we've got you. And it was like they it was like they reached through the phone and picked me up in their hands and they were holding me. They were listening to me. They were firefighters listening to me that get it, that understood PTSD. They understood addiction. I mean, I was on the phone with with I I'm, I think he's he was from Philadelphia. Mark was, I think, believe from a captain from Philadelphia. I'm not positive, but then um uh, Mike was from New York, and then uh, there was another chief of police from Chicago, and they all took time to listen and talk with me and, and help me understand that what I'm going through, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not damaged to the point where I can't get some help and recover. And they talked about something called EMDR, 
eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And as they're talking about this, it's like, okay, this, this is something I've got to try something. So we got done talking and, and they get, got me the phone number for the village in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, it's a family services for, for mental health and for a lot of things, but um, in my case, it was for mental health. And they did EMDR there. So they got me the phone number and I called and I still, I never really asked them, but I'm kind of guessing they must have called ahead of time and said, you got to get this guy in because I got an appointment for eight o'clock the next morning. And I hung up and I'm like, I'm feeling great. I'm like, okay, somebody's listening. I got this EMDR to go with. I'm turning things around. I'm going in the right direction. And when that gun didn't go off and after talking to them, them guys, it's like, okay, there's a reason that gun didn't go off. You know, I was still scared to death of that thing that the bullet was still coming down the barrel and, and this was just a fantasy or something that was live, you know, cause who knows what happens after death, you know, I'm, maybe they're showing me a different way where I, what would have worked if I would have done something different. But I started studying EMDR and again, I was on meth, so I didn't sleep. So I studied EMDR. I probably watched every YouTube video there was on it and Googled it. And I tell you what, I, I just didn't understand how this was going to help. You know, it didn't make any sense. It looked kind of like witchcraft to me. And, you know, they're going to do this light bar in front of me and I'm going to talk about my problems and I'm going to release them and I'm going to feel better. It's like, ah, I doubt that's going to work, but I made the appointment and I've, I, I've got to try something. What do I have to lose? So I, I ended up driving to Fargo the next day, which was a long, long ride. Um, and I got there and got in there and the first couple sessions that we did, was just a matter of talking about things, talking about what was affecting me. I still didn't blame the car accidents or this fire department. I didn't make that connection. I thought that I was hurt so bad because I didn't have any feelings. I didn't love anybody. I didn't love myself. I, I was numb. And my world was just gray and dark and shadowy and just cold. And Somehow along the line, I thought a girl must have done that to me. You know, an old girlfriend must have hurt me so bad where I just got cold and I, I'm never going to let anybody get close to me. You know, so right away there, I'm blaming somebody else for it. Um, but the third session, I got there and I knew we were going to set the light bar up and we we're actually doing the, going to do the processing. How, how far apart are these sessions, Scott? Um, the first two were a week apart. Okay. And it was, it was tough. I mean, I didn't do a whole lot of changing and, and I probably didn't do any changing. It's just, I had some hope because I, I was actually talking with somebody I was listening. Plus I had Mark and Mike that I was talking to. And, you know, I had other people I was telling to, you know, I was telling some of the firefighters about this, some of the ones I could trust. And they were there for me. They're like, man, Scott, yeah, if you ever get to that point, you give us a call. We, you know, we're here for you. You know, and I, I did feel a lot of embarrassment and shame. I felt, you know, how could I be this weak firefighter? You know, and I just had so much on my shoulders still. But on the third session, I went in and uh, in the parking lot of the village in Fargo, I snorted three huge lines of meth in my car before I went in there. And you got to understand, I couldn't do anything without meth. I mean, it was my coping, my horrible coping skill. And um, I went in there and I did the EMDR and wow, it was, it, I, just, I, I mean, the one session, I started feeling a peace inside. I started feeling, I mean, I started feeling like I was losing weight, like I was taking this crusty jacket with like dry tar on it. And it's like, I was taking it off piece by piece and I was getting lighter and lighter as I was talking about things and I was getting this peace inside me and this, this really cool feeling and I was letting go of things. And that first session with the light bar on the way back on the way back home, there was a, uh, there was a sunflower field on the side of the road and I never noticed it before. I mean, I never noticed the houses. I was starting to notice things, but that sunflower field was just bright yellow. And I pulled over onto the dirt road and I, I, I just lost it. I walked up to him and said, like, where did the colors come from? I 
couldn't see colors. I mean, they were there. I could tell you what color things were, but they weren't, they were like, it was like neon signs all, all around me and the sky and the blue sky and how many different shades of green. And I, I couldn't see any of that before. My mind was so tangled up in itself that it wasn't allowing outside things in the, the good positive things. It was all negative. Um, but yeah, and then I had six sessions total. And oh my gosh, it was, I came out of there smiling, a real smile. I wasn't hiding anything. I was, I was me. I got, I was telling everybody. I mean, I, I couldn't shut up about it. I was telling everybody what happened, especially firefighters. I'm like, guys have to watch out for this stuff. It, I mean, it almost killed me. And I could see some of the patterns, you know, that the alcoholism or not necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily call it alcoholism. I'd just call it, you know, drink and excess of drinking or, you know, the relationship issues. I've seen a lot of that, the, the reckless driving, the recklessness in general. Um, you know, I, I could see it in others, but I wasn't going to preach at them. I was just going to say, hey, this is what happened to me. Take it or leave it. And it was amazing how, how people started opening up and talking. You know, it, I got it. They could trust me. Who, you know, how am I supposed to judge anybody? I, can't, I don't have the right to judge anybody. After the person I was, I can't judge anybody. But you know, it's it's just how fast everything turned around. In fact, one of the one of my one of the my favorite memories is um, I was sitting in my driveway, and my sons were in the car, and in my yard I had a picnic table. And I told my sons, I said, you got to check this out. I said, watch this. I said, when I was 18 years old, I used to be able to jump over picnic tables. I used to hurdle them and show off, you know, to the girls and stuff when I was in high school. And I said, watch this. And I took off and I took off running at that picnic table and I tried to hurdle it. Oh. I, I almost made it. <laughs> I wiped out really, really bad. I didn't break anything, but I came hobbling back to the car and my sons were like, yeah, that was really cool, Dad. And I said, well, I feel like good. I thought I could do it. And, um, you know, that's, that's how young I felt. I mean, I felt great again. Um, two weeks later, I stretched out for a couple of weeks and two weeks later I went out and, uh, I jumped that picnic table and I didn't have, you know, the first time most of my neighbors were out in the yard and they see me biff it. And it's like, Oh man, Scott's lost it again. <laughs> Second time I went out there and I jumped it and I'm looking around it's like nobody see it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. But it felt good. I mean, 46 years old, I jumped, I jumped the picnic table. I mean, that's, I felt like I was 18. But it's how much life changed. I mean, it was a matter of a month after I started reaching out and getting help with EMDR. And it doesn't work for everybody. You know, no therapy does. But EMDR, I've had a lot of people that have helped go to EMDR sessions and, and you know, talk to them about EMDR. They've gotten EMDR, and they've, they've seen progress with it it works and it's it's painless i mean you go in and you talk about it, you just it, it's reprocessing you let it go and it takes a, a heck of a load off your shoulders it, you know basically it's you know if, if we would have had debriefings i don't know if i would have got ptsd i don't know we did the fact is we didn't have them or i didn't go to them and you know it's almost like the way I see EMDR is almost like the after fact of, okay, now you've got to do this to process this stuff, to get it out of you. Um, I felt like I had, I mean, when I was talking about it, just, I could feel it leaving my body kind of. Um, I used to have a lot of back pain back then and that went away. Um, shoulder pains, you know, the, the physical pain even went away. And that's a lot with mental health is you can have physical pain too that is, you know, connected with it. How many, how many sessions, um, you say it was the third session that really helped you start to make the turn. Yeah. Were all three sessions the same type of treatment or were they doing different things in each of the sessions and then what they did on the third one really nailed it for you? Well, the first two we just talked about it, they were trying to figure out what is causing it. So when we set the light bar up and the vibrating pads on the legs and stuff, then we could go in and process. And we did about six of those. So we went in and talked about things. And on the first one, he started, we started, I, I remember talking about 
trying to figure out, okay, let's go back and talk about your girlfriend, your ex-girlfriend, what, you know, a long time ago, what, what happened? And I was going into that and all of a sudden, boom, like, oh, I started talking about a car accident. And I mean, it was really vivid. It was like, it was just happening. I could smell, you know, it's in my mind, I could smell the exhaust. I could, I could hear the screams and I talked about it. And so it's like, oh my God, it's the first time I've talked about it. And I talked my way through it and it's like, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't kill that person. They were gone. I mean, there was nothing we could do. And just understanding that and letting it go. And then the, the feeling in my chest, you know, we did that like three times in each session and each time it got less and less. And I, it was, I don't know, it was just so peaceful. Um, I, you know, it, the best thing I can say is what I would almost say, and, and this probably isn't what EMDR people want me to say, but it was almost like when I, in my nightmares, my uncontrolled thoughts, my subconscious, when I went to sleep and had those nightmares, it was, it was a subconscious coming out. When I was doing the EMDR and I was watching this light go back and forth, it's almost like it put me in the REM mode of sleep, but I was wide awake. It was, it was letting thoughts release themselves. And I let them go. I mean, it, it, it hurt to talk about the first time. And it's, but at the same time, it's like, I want this out of me. I, it felt like an infection. I'm like, I'm, it's out. I'm going to let this go. I kind of feel bad for my therapist sometimes because I wonder if he ever had any second, secondary tra tra trauma from what I was doing. But, you know, I mean, it's, he, was, he was all smiles when I was done. As well as I was just, I, I couldn't, I mean, I, I just felt so good that I was a huge success story for him. Um, how long does each session last? It's an hour long session. So about 50 minutes. Okay. And then is there any sedation or anything involved with that as well? Nope. Nope. Just a, uh, just a light bar and some vibrating pads on my legs. And sometimes I use like the hearing, they can have sounds go back and forth, but just, it kind of activates both sides of the brain. And yeah, you basically just reprocess it. And some, you know, I'm, I'm not, up on all the scientific stuff or whatever, you know, they're talking about with the brain, but it works. Um, you know, the brain's powerful, very powerful. And how many total sessions uh, in your series did you complete? Um, you mean from first time I went to the last time? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it was right around eight. I'm thinking it was like six sessions of lights and two that were just talking, but okay. I went back and I don't even know the date of when I pulled the trigger. Yeah. You know, that's in my past. I just, you know, I, I don't. And, and the thing is those three lines of meth I did, that was the last three lines of meth I did in my, in sense. And I'm not going to ever do any more. I walked away cold Turkey from a line an hour meth addiction after that first session of EMDR. Wow. And that's powerful. And I didn't go to, I didn't get treatment. Nobody knew it was a secret. I mean, I laid, I laid in bed for a week, you know, just coming down off a of meth and, oh, it was hell. It was, and all these thoughts coming back and happy thoughts, bad thoughts. I mean, my mind was going a million miles per hour and I was coming down off a of meth, but I started to sleep again. I could close my eyes and actually get some rest. And, and then I started letting the positives back into my mind and, Oh, I sleep great now. I mean, it's, I probably sleep too much. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> All right, I mean, so, I, so bring us along. You have the eight sessions. You're, you're off meth. You're sleeping better. So how does your life um, traverse from, from there? Um, it, I don't know. It was, it was kind of weird because I, like I said, I couldn't stop talking about it. So I was reaching out to other fire departments and I wanted to come in and talk. And um, a lot of, a lot of odd things happened. I kept finding myself in the right place at the right time. Um, people were reaching out to me that I never would have guessed would have been hurting on the inside. You know, they looked like they had everything together. They were very successful people and, and, and they were crashing. I mean, they were suicidal. They were some some were doing doing drugs, and most of them were just you know mental health stuff. And they reached out, and we got talking, and 
it was almost like I was a magnet. Um, and then I got the opportunity to speak at the uh, Minnesota State Fire Chiefs Conference and in Duluth, and I spoke there. And, and that was the first time that when I took the stage, I told myself that I'm probably gonna get booed off this stage. They are probably gonna hate my guts because I'm gonna be talking about this stuff and I'm gonna let them have it. I've got the chiefs here, I got the officers here and I'm gonna let them have it because they're responsible for their, their, for their firefighters and, and mental health has to be just as much of a training as anything else out there. We're losing firefighters to mental health, to suicide, more than we're losing on the fire scenes. So I just let it, let it go, I'm, you know. And when I was done, instead of getting booed off a of stage, like I thought I was gonna, I got a standing ovation and, and wow, I mean, I, I never guessed in a million years I'd have got that kind of response. And I, I mean, I couldn't even look at the audience. I, I just couldn't believe what was happening that they were actually listening. And I basically was talking about the elephant in the room that nobody wanted to talk about. And, you know, I'll do the dirty work. I'll talk about it. You know, a lot of times it's, it's taboo. It's, it's a stigma around it that you don't want to bring that up because you don't want to be seen as weak. Well, when I got done with that mentally, I, I'm probably the strongest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm probably carrying 10 times or more daily than I had then. I just know how you know, to reach out to my supports, to, to use my skills, to not let it grow on me, not let it infect me and let it go. Um, I, got, I got an amazing German Shepherd. He's a big part of it. Um, he's actually a service dog, but I don't use him as a service dog. He's more now for when I go and meet with people. So I don't have physical contact with people. He can have the physical contact because when somebody's in that vulnerable spot, it's just not a good mix to, even a hug can send mixed messages. But, but yeah, it just took off after after that Chiefs conference. People started calling me from around the country and wanted me to come speak. And, and the more I did that, the more I came in contact with people from all around the country that, you know, would call me up. And, you know, unfortunately, some of them had guns and I was their last phone call and they'd tell me that. And it's like, I've been in that, I've been in that place, you know, so you know, let's talk about this. Let's, let's get you some help. But it's not a weakness. It's, you know, I heard you say it earlier, PTSI. It's an injury. The brain can heal. Um, you know, reaching out for help was probably the hardest thing I did. That's probably the most strength I've ever had was to reach out for help and to keep calling 18 times before I got somebody some help. Mm -hmm. I kept up. I kept going. And that's what's important is, you know, not, not everybody is on board yet with mental health, unfortunately. You know, I do hear some of the bullying going around, but for the most part, we're a family. We're brothers and sisters, whether we're police officers or firefighters or EMS or even military or, or correction officers, we have to be there for each other. Uh, it's definitely are you, a weakness. Are you back in Frazee working at your shop now? I actually walked away from the shop. Um, I lost my mechanic skills. I, it's not the direction I was supposed to be going in. And it's, I don't know how you can explain it, but I basically walked away from it and I don't even change my own oil on my car. But I, again, I work in mental health and mental health crisis stabilization. And I answer crisis calls and I never dreamt I could do that and make a difference in people's lives and have patience and listen. So all of this shifted your, your interest and your profession to, to a whole new line of work now that is driven in a passion to serve others based on what happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got all my fingernails and no grease on my fingers. So I'm loving this, <laughs> you know, mechanic work. It's not an easy job. And, the stress levels there. I mean, constantly customers wondering when their vehicle is going to be done. They get the wrong parts or something else goes wrong. And I, yeah, it's, I, I did my time doing that and moved on to something totally different. Yeah. I mean, I get to go around traveling, you know, it's, and meet so many neat people. Yeah. 
<laughs> when when we can travel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when we get back to it. <laughs> oh, I miss it. And, and that's another thing, you know, I, as, as much as I had my life together and I've got it together, you know, with this pandemic, it, it did affect me. I mean, I was going out and traveling and I, I turned into this social butterfly. I mean, I used to be isolating myself in my shop and then I turned into a social butterfly. And when all this stuff happened, you know, my girlfriend, she's even like, we've got to get outside this house. We got to do something because it's affecting you. I used to go out and have a beer with the guys or whatever. And when that was taken away, I had to, I had to readjust and use some different coping skills. Now, um, what's your, what's your relationship now with your kids? Um, and if I, if I ask a question, that's too personal. Just tell me you don't want to talk about that. No, um, they're, they're growing up, um, 22 and 19. So my one lives down in the cities now. And, um, you know, definitely not a perfect, perfect situation by no means, but, um, you know, we've had our, our setbacks and, and, you know, and the thing is they've known exactly what I went through. I didn't hide it from them. Um, it's kind of more of acceptance on their side also, you know, is, is dad back? Is he really this person? Cause he, he said he was how many times before? And he never changed. So it's, it's going to take a long time to heal that. And I'm kind of guessing it might, might take as long as, you know, for them to start having kids or something. And, you know, we, we, we celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving and stuff together, but, you know, unfortunately my one lives down in the cities and my one, other one lives around Frazee and, um, you know, 19 year old, they don't want to hang around dad all the time. Right. No. <laughs> going on. But when you were going through the height of this, your kids were how old? 10, 11? It was six years ago. So it was six. Okay. Well, the end of this month would have been, it will be six years. Okay. So teenagers, yeah. did, they, did they know what was, I mean, did they know the kind of things that were happening to I, I I'd like to think, I, I, you correct me if I get this wrong, that they really didn't know what was going on in real time. Do they now know what was going on then? Have you know? Have you been able to share with them, like you know, what you're sharing with me and others here? Do they yeah. know this stuff now? Yeah, you know, they definitely know. Um, my younger son knew right away. Um, you know, we we're best buddies, and he he was like a bugger. I couldn't get rid of him. I mean, he was just always sticking to me and stay. You know, we we're best best friends. And um, what's really interesting is. About six months, it was like December of 2014, that, that winter after my suicide attempt, we were in Fargo here grow, um, Christmas shopping. And I looked over at my son and, and I said, you know, I'm so glad that gun didn't go off. And he looked at me and he said, dad, the gun did go off. It killed the bad dad. And that was when I started realizing, okay, he's seeing the change, you know, I am changed. You know, it was really nice to hear from him to say that. Because, I mean, it, you know, my older son was pushing me away, and but he was at that age again too. You know, teenage age, and yeah. you know, I just gave him their space, and like I'm not going to force myself on anybody. Yeah. Scott, what advice would you give to first responders? Now, I know you know you're out on the circuit, you're speaking, so I know that from the stage you're giving advice. So give some of that advice now to the listeners and viewers of this show after, you know, looking in hindsight of what you've been through, what, how could you help them with some, some words of wisdom? Um, debriefings. Use them. Make sure people get debriefings. Make sure you follow up with everybody. If you start seeing a firefighter or an officer acting out, changing, um, take, you know, take notice of that. Pull them aside and talk with them. Give them some phone numbers. You know, tell them to, to watch some, you know, give them some information on PTSD and have them watch some videos or something and let them know it's okay. We've got Minfire in, in Minnesota now. Give them that phone number. It's peers that can talk with them. You know, don't let them get to that point or don't let yourself even get to that point where you can't help yourself anymore. Because I got into that slippery slope and I couldn't reach out for help anymore. Um, 
they can put uh, the helpline numbers in your phone. So if somebody reaches out to you, you have it available. If you need it, you have it available. Give them a call before it becomes a crisis. Um, we now do, at Frazee, they do things after the call, you know, and well, again, volunteer fire department, after the call, everybody goes into the meeting room after a, a fatality. And we talk, hey, what did you do? You know, because that was something that was bothering me too, because on these scenes, it, it's like, well, so-and-so was over there doing this. He was just wasting his time and where he was doing more damage to us than he was doing good. Now, when we get in the room and they talk about it and they say what they were doing, it's like, oh God, I didn't know you were doing that. I thought you were slough, you know, I thought you were totally doing something different, but it makes sense when everybody puts their input in what they were doing and why they were doing it. Cause you, you don't get that 360 view when you're in one spot looking around and plus there's a lot going on. So you don't catch everything. Even if you have somebody stand right next to you, they see a whole different picture than you do. So sometimes, um, sometimes uh, people who see the problem in others, they don't speak up because they don't know what to say or they don't know how to say it. So what I want you to do is to coach me that if when you were going through the midst of all this, what would you have wanted if, you know, if you and I were friends and I was on your department, what would you have wanted me to say to you that would have helped you to get the help that you needed? How, how does that conversation sound? That's, that's always a tough question for me because it, it depends on where it would be in the cycle I was going through. Because the last few years, I don't think anybody could have got through to me. I mean, my fire chief and the police chief came and talked to me one day. They said they were worried about me. I bullshitted them. I, I'm fine. I just got a lot of stuff going on. I got the shop. I got a lot of family things going on. I, I just, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. That's all. That's all it is. I'm fine. You know, I just BS them. And, you know, I had a gram of meth in my, gram of meth in the drawer right next to me and a loaded 44. I wasn't fine. You know, I mean, how much do you hound somebody without hounding them? You know, it's, it's difficult. I think the best thing to do is just make it okay for people to talk about things. And leadership is important on this. And I've, I'm seeing a lot of it now where the leaders will actually come out and talk about if they've got, if they've gone through PTSD or if they had to go see a therapist or something and just sharing that experience, it's okay. We're human. We're not superheroes. I mean, we're not these, these machines that can just absorb all this stuff and, and not be affected because it affects us. But it starts at the top. You know, the leaders have to buy into this and say, hey, it's okay not to be okay. And if anybody has, you know, something going on, their doors open or have some peers on the fire department that are trained to listen, non judgmental you know, just have some selected and, you know, all, it doesn't have to be a chief. A lot of times it's really hard to talk to a supervisor or a chief or a higher up. So just have a variety of them through the fire department and have resources available to them. Yeah. If, if someone wanted to reach you, um, maybe they have a follow-up question. Maybe they want to book you for a program. Maybe it's just somebody that wants to learn more about what you went through with EMDR. How, how would somebody find you in the world? Do you have a website or an email or something that they could find you at? Um, yeah, it's seeingincoloragain.com. Seeing? Yeah, seeingincoloragain.com. Okay. And uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for, uh, for folks. And then there, I assume that on that website, there is a, like a contact me link or something like that, that yep. they, that they could uh, reach out. Do you have resources on the, on that site for people who might need help? Um, it's, I'm not actually sure where it's at right now. We're still working on it a little bit. So. Okay. Um, but it is, yeah, a launch, it is, it's a launch site that, that, you know, they can go to them and, and yeah. Yeah. And get my email and email me. Yeah. yeah. And tells us some stories on there um, about some, you know, a chain of events. Um, I mean, I never dreamt that this would, what I'm doing, I, I wouldn't have to be direct contact with somebody to be helping them because my story has been told through other people. Other people have shared my stories and have talked with people um, and, you know, it's saved lives. And it wasn't directly from me. It was somebody hearing it and telling somebody else. And 
it's it's amazing how the ripple effect is and and making it okay to talk about this and reach out, especially with the spouses of the significant others. We have to get them involved because they're the ones who are going to see it first. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Yeah. Get the resources there for them and. You know, if you have somebody that all of a sudden just up and I'm, I'm off the fire department, I'm done. Hey, that's that's one of us. You can't just walk, let them walk out into the world. If there's something going on with them, we got to be there for them. There's a lot of retired firefighters and, and first responders taking their lives. And, you know, it's we've got to step up and do more. Well, you stepped up here, and I appreciate you reaching out to me and agreeing to be on the show and to share this very powerful story. And I'm very confident that it will be inspiring and helpful to others to know that there's somebody who has walked in the shoes that they're walking in and felt the pain that they're feeling now. And you, and you give them hope that there, that there is, there is a way out of their, out of their, their entrapment in this, um, in this challenge that they have with this post-traumatic stress injury. And there, there is a way for it to be managed in a way to get healed, in a way to recover and regain your life and see in color. Yeah. Again, it's such a powerful statement. Scott, thank you so much for being with me. Yep, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Thank you again to my guest, Scott Geiselhart, for sharing your experiences with us. Remember, this is part two of a two-part interview, so if you missed last week's episode, be sure to go back and check out episode 333. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and 87,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you or someone you care about works in a high-risk, high-consequence, decision-making environment, then we are here to help to improve their safety and survival and to help them accomplish the most important mission of all, and that is to go home whole and healthy to the ones who love them. Since the start of the pandemic, I've had some amazing opportunities to present programs on the virtual platform to groups ranging from 6 to 400. And a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to present to first responders of the Atlantic provinces of Canada. If you're not familiar with them, that's the regions of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, and Labrador. And now, I've been to uh, Newfoundland before as I presented for the Canadian Fire Chiefs Association in St. John a few years ago, and it's absolutely a beautiful, beautiful region. Over 12,000 firefighters serve the Atlantic provinces and about 300 of them attended the live program and all 12,000 of them are gonna be given a playback link so they all can watch it. Talk about a value for the investment. If you're interested in seeing all of our events, past, virtual, postponed, and future, they're all listed on the SA Matters website. If you're interested in seeing the list of where we've been or where we're going, just head over to the website and click on Program Dates under the Live Training tab at the top of the homepage. If you're interested in hosting a virtual program or a live program when the pandemic is over, just click the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage, and I will give you a call. Remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There we're sharing ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 334 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Scott Geiselhart. Remember that this is part two of a two-part interview, so if you missed last week, you might want to go back and give episode 333 a listen. Thank you to our amazing platinum sponsor for six years now, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Gasaway Virtual Training. And thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. But most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. 
You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.